Well, hello. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day of Smart City Expo. Hope that you didn't have a lot of trouble trying to get in because of the rain. Uh, there's a lot of delays, public transportation, some people soaked. So but we're all here, so it's, and that's good. Um, so this is going to be a solutions talk. We're going to be talking about the right to the city, education, and entrepreneurship. My name is Carlos Ferreiro. I'm, I've been for the last 10 years dedicated to building the city as an open innovation ecosystem and uh, working with cities around the world, um, from Barcelona to Dubai, from Hong Kong to New York, from San Francisco to Berlin. Basically trying to use the power of creativity, technology, and in general entrepreneurship within cities to solve some of the impending social uh, problems that we have or challenges that we have. So I won't talk much about that, but um, because I think that we're going to be going over, um, we're going to be going over uh, basically the complexity of the city with our panelists today. So we will be talking about cities um, as they really are, complex ecosystems, which are culturally, technologically, socially culturally so diverse that they have inherent richness within to solve some of the challenges that we are facing. Um, this is the challenge of humanity, right? To try to figure out how to live better in cities since most of us are going to are already living here and we will continue to do so. So make our cities more inclusive. The right, the right to the city um, will be discussed here today. Or, how to make our cities a living classroom. You know, learning that the city is a wonderful environment to really understand the human needs and opportunities. So using the, classroom, the, the city as a classroom environment, as a learning environment for our um, youth to really be, become the solution, make, the solution builders that they, that they have the potential to become. And also the city as a, as a bedrock for entrepreneurship. We cannot understand the city um, without understanding the potential that it has for building new things, for building new value, for building new solutions, for building new understandings that are going to transform our lives. And this is done with basically the entrepreneurship spirit. So our speakers, um, this morning are going to be talking about all of these issues. So to get us started, I would like to invite um, Edna Pasher. She is the founder and CEO of um, she's the founder and CEO of uh, Edna Pasher PhD and Associates. Um, she's also the founder and chairperson of the Israeli Smart Cities Institute, member of the European Center for Women and Technology, and uh, she will be talking to us about the city as a classroom, and about educating children for entrepreneurship. So please give her a hand. Hi, Anna, would you like to sit, or would you like to? Um, I always like to sit. So okay. please, Just so please sit. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, we didn't know if this was a good choice or a bad one, but uh, we have uh, more people um, in our institute who told me that it's a good choice to do it here in the Agora, in the center of the city. And of course, as you know, the Agora is the old uh, name of uh, the center of the city in old Greece, where the cities really started. So, um, um, I don't have a... Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. 
Okay. So first of all, a little about the Israel Smart Cities Institute. There are a few of our experts here, so you can meet them later on. The idea is that uh, it's too complex to be one expert who works with the city, that we need to collaborate from interdisciplinary areas of expertise in order to support municipalities on their pathway to become smarter. And the other thing is that many, many organizations try to help cities by creating strategies, big books of strategies that nothing comes out of them, and we are focused on implementation as well. The other thing as a basis is that you cannot have a smart city without smart education. And you cannot have smart education without a smart city. So these two really feed each other, and it's very important that we remember that. I took an idea by Marshall McLuhan from the 70s. That's the name of his book, City as Classroom. It was never implemented, at least as far as I know, and we decided to take a good idea and to implement it. And this is what my presentation is all about. I want to emphasize that we are active not only in Israel, but all over the world, in China, in Europe. Um, yesterday, I was honored to participate in a workshop here in the FIRA to help the city of Belgrade become smarter. So it's very important that um, we try these ideas all over the world, and you are welcome to be in touch with us. Um, the project that I'm going to tell you in these few minutes that I have is in one of the elementary schools in Israel, in the city of Ramat Gan. The ages of the children that were involved in this project, 9 to 14. And what came out of our project is that we had eight startups, all kinds of smart solutions for the city of Ramat Gan, created by kids ages 9 to 14. It's very important, everybody asks us, how come Israel is a startup nation, second to the Silicon Valley in terms of startups and innovation, well known all over the world. There is no miracle. We just invest in um, becoming a, a startup nations. And one of the investments is to teach children not to be employed, but to create their own businesses the way you are going to see it here. The eight startups that came out of our project, you can see the list. They invented a smart safari, a smart drinking fountain, a smart bus, smart supermarket cart, smart garbage can, smart mirror, smart... I will not go into all of the details because we don't have time, but it's really amazing how they came up with the idea. I have to say, the teachers at first were not that sure that this can happen, but we show them all the adults have to do is to let go and the kids become entrepreneurs. And here is the, st the, the process. We started with a knowledge cafe in which the children were encouraged to look for opportunities to develop smart solutions for their city. Pay attention to the fact that we are not using problems and challenges. Everybody here talks about problems and challenges. We never speak about problems and challenges. Only opportunities because of, you know, every problem is an opportunity and every challenge is an opportunity. So the kids were uh, encouraged to look for opportunities to create startups in their own city. Then, of course, uh, you have to go through the idea pipeline of feasibility studies, of go, no, go. Everything was done by the children with support of adults. 
One of the adults is sitting here, Dr. Royal Yaniv. He is a speaker on the panel as well. And you will see a picture of him later on when part of the city where the kids studied was in the Barilan University. Now, to think that you put kids in a building that looks like a factory and you expect them to become entrepreneurs is really ridiculous. When the city of Ramat Gan has so much to offer, including such a great university as the Barilan University, you really have to let them study from everybody. Here is the first exposure. The kids pitch their different ideas for the startups. The person is the ex-mayor of the city of Ramat Gan. Unfortunately, he was not re-elected. And we can only hope that the next one is going to embrace our project and not to stop it. Here you see our first day of the kids all over the city in the Barilan University with Dr. Royal Yaniv, who will be on the stage uh, shortly. Uh, in the city, all over the city, in different places, talking to people, understanding what they like, what they don't like, doing a needs analysis, doing all kinds of surveys, doing participant observations, everything that is really done in a good innovation uh, project. And of course, you cannot do innovation without prototyping. So you can see the different prototypes that the kids did for a smart uh, water fountain, for a smart super, um, a supermarket card, etc. Now, after I showed you the picture, very quickly, the guidelines that we had, the principles behind it. First of all, we know that it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, in a complex environment, it is not enough to have parents and teachers at, at teaching kids. The whole village needs to do it. This comes from Africa, from a very well-known proverb. It takes the whole village to raise a child. The other principle is that the children are digital natives and the teachers are digital immigrants. So why not let the kids teach the, the, the teachers how to help them, how to support them? The next principle, which is very important, comes from um, my community of experts. Whatever the problem, community is the answer. We cannot succeed to become smart cities if the community is not involved. We had so many people supporting from the community, mentors, all kinds of people with high-tech expertise who volunteered to help the children. And last but not least, entrepreneurship and innovation is the competitive edge of the future. You know, they keep asking me, what will the next generation need? What will these kids need in the future? They cannot expect to find a job. There will not be enough jobs for, for uh, our children and grandchildren. The only thing that we can expect is for them to start their own businesses, to become self-employed, to be able to be entrepreneurs and innovators. So this is why it is so important to start very young. This year we go on and we move, as in any innovation project, from prototyping to full implementation, again with the support of Barilan University. And this is my story in five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edna. Thank you, Edna. Oh, yes, please. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Edna, for your inspiring talk and your project. Um, next up would be Dr. Eyal Yaniv. He is the founder of various startups and joint ventures. He's currently the chairman of Barilan. 
of Barilan um, Business School and the director of the Barilan University Center for Smart Cities in Israel. His research interests include smart cities, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And he's going to talk to us about the model um, for the important role of universities in the innovation ecosystem. So please, a hand for Eyal. Thank you, Carl. This, and here's you. So l let me first share with you uh, two uh, major observations that I have after visiting in this uh, uh, event for the last two days. So two major observations. One, one is that, uh, in my view, there is still no impressive breakthroughs in the domain of smart cities. Uh, it looks the same like last year. Uh, no, nothing really new, the same, uh, uh, the same booth, the same ideas in the conference and in the exhibition as well. But there is a, one, one change, is the recognition of the importance of factors other than technology. In the last few years, if we came here, it was only about technology. And uh, my talk is related to, to the previous talk of uh, Dr. Edna Pasha, um, that we need much more than technology. And Edna tells me for years, needs become before technology and not vice versa, which we, we often found in the last few years that technology and technology providers pushed all, all the, the process of uh, smart cities. So uh, going from, from these uh, two observations, I would like to, to go uh, our uh, definition for smart city, which I think it's obvious, is making people happier in the city. This is the idea. It's not about technology. It's just about pe making people happier, making, improving the well-being of people in, in cities. And in order to do that, we need an integration of knowledge that comes from different sources, not only the uh, technology providers, but also uh, knowledge that comes from university, from the cities. The cities has best practices that sometimes help more than the, the knowledge that comes from uh, the technology providers, consultants, etc. So if we know how to make this integration, I believe that we will see very soon, we will see, we'll see breakthroughs. And the recognition that not only technology uh, uh, is, is the main drive will, will bring these uh, this, uh, breakthroughs. Um, I'm, I'm uh, from, from Bar-Ilan University, and uh, I think, I believe that there is a new role for the academy uh, in creating and distributed knowledge. Let me just mention the, the traditional mission of universities all over the world. It's a very simple and short mission to create and distribute knowledge. This is the mission of universities for hundreds of years. Um, I believe that today there is a change, a big change. Because in the past, 20, 30 years ago, um, the, the universities created most of the knowledge in the world. This is not true anymore. Knowledge is created everywhere. Knowledge is created by technology providers, by the cities, by, by citizens, by consultants, etc. So the new mission should be, it is not still the mission, but it should, it should be to facilitate the distribution of knowledge created by other entities in the ecosystem. So if we know how to do that, then we can integrate knowledge and, and make uh, much useful and, and important uh, knowledge. So the university campus as, as a smart city, uh, this is our model. Uh, the university campus uh, is actually a small city. We, have, we are facing all the problems that cities uh, are facing, uh, parking, waste, energy, transportation, etc. Uh, so the campus became a living lab uh, to test and demonstrate all kinds of solutions. We, we call the, the technology providers, why don't you use this campus as your ongoing uh, continuous uh, uh, exhibition? and an opportunity to collaborate with researchers, with the cities, uh, etc. So scientists, decision makers, citizens, entrepreneurs are all together trying to, to investigate, to test, and to, to talk about the needs and 
the uh, technologies available to solve or to answer these needs. The case of Barilan is very special. The case of Barilan, this is the map. Uh, in the middle, you can see Barilan University in, in uh, uh, orange. And we are surrounded by seven cities and one big campus of a big hospital. Uh, so strategically, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity for us to serve as the hub for all these seven cities. All these seven cities, they are all small, medium-sized cities, all together with more than 700,000 uh, 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 residents more than the number of residents in Tel Aviv, which is the, the largest city in the area. Uh, so we called this, uh, these guys, we called these mayors and told them, we're going to be your hub, we're going to be your uh, help to, to build your own uh, uh, smart cities. Since they are all uh, small or medium sized, they have a lot of difficulties to do it the, the by themselves. But when we uh, call them and trying to, to uh, encourage a region, a smart region, it's much easier for everybody. Maybe the technology providers don't like it because the technology providers like to sell technology for each and every city. We can do it once. We do it for, for, for all of them and we are trying to investigate that. So uh, the, the idea is that we put together cities, industry and researchers. In the center is the living lab and they are all benefit from this collaboration with each other. I know that my time is, is finished, so I'll jump to uh, just to show you a selected list of, of joint projects. Uh, in this project, uh, cities are involved, technology providers are involved, and of course, uh, scientists. Just to mention one of them, Urban Heat Island is a big problem in cities, uh, an area in the city which is warmer than other areas. In, in this project, uh, we have technology providers that provide sensors and vertical planting. Uh, we have scientists from uh, engineering, from medical school, from geography, uh, from botanics. They're all working together on a solution. And at the end of it, there is also even a uh, um, professor of law. He's, he's expert of uh, uh, law regulation, environment regulation. So he's going to, to recommend to the regulator what to do with the, the uh, problem and what we can do to solve it. Um, next step is building a global network of, of uh, similar centers. We are already uh, in a process of, of uh, talking to other universities in the world. Uh, we have connections with uh, Berlin, Budapest, uh, Venice in Italy, and we are building uh, now a big center in the Hangzhou city in, uh, in China. It's a small city of 12, 12 million people. Uh, so uh, a similar center is built there these days, and we are very proud of this, and we are looking for more and more partners uh, in the world. So uh, as I said, b smart cities is, is about being, uh, doing, making people happier. I hope I made you a little bit happier than we started, so thank you very much. Thank you, Yal. That was wonderful. Thank you. So uh, I feel a little bit happier. So that's, that should count for something. Um, so next up, I would like to, inv uh, to invite Guillem Martinez Roura. He's the president and spokesperson and of the organizing committee and chief financial officer of RoboCat. That's the robotics competition of Catalonia. He's also the vice president of the association El Racó dels, Robot dels Robotaires. And uh, he will be talking to us about the role of robotics, and especially in educational robotics. So please give a, uh, Guillem a hand, please. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as uh, he said, my name is Guillem Martinez Roura. I'm the uh, president of Catalonia Robotic Championship. And I'm going to talk about educational robotics implemented through new and innovative technological learning formulas. It is a reality that we are living uh, an authentic robotization in many sectors of our society. Consequently, our organization uh, thinks that it's really important to help young people immerse themselves in the technological world. Because of that, uh, our organization uh, implements 
a robotic challenge in which students can test their knowledge of, uh, develop and test their knowledge of technology, uh, mathematics, arts, and science. Uh, our uh, product has three main distinctive characteristics. First and foremost, it is part of a new concept of technological projects in which uh, there is no restriction regarding uh, the programming and software uh, and materials used to construct the robot. I mean, this may seem the most common, but it is not. In fact, we are one of the first championships all over the world that has implemented free robotics. Our second objective is uh, to um, foster a low-cost educational robotics in which economic barriers are no longer an impediment to participate in uh, technology uh, challenges. We give priority to the fact that the vast majority of our students in uh, our schools and high schools have the possibility to be part in a, a technology uh, challenge. So we place the educational commitment ahead of the economic profit. Moreover, uh, we want to implement uh, this educational robotics through an, a really interdisciplinary environment. We think that apart from deepening in the technological field, our students have the opportunity to learn about more subjects, about uh, um, uh, about more subjects. I don't know if history, science, maths. It depends on uh, each edition of uh, our competition. So this uh, the competition uh, game every year is based on different elements and aspects of the uh, natural, uh, cultural. Um, heritage of Catalonia. This year in particular, the competition is based on the rebellion of Remences. It might seem really strange, but it was a conflict between the Catalan peasant farmers against feudal nobility in the uh, crisis of the final Middle Ages. So it was the first uh, movement of the, um, the farmers in whole Europe that would fulfill the abolishment of the feudal abuses uh, in exchange of a compensation uh, of some quantity of money to the feudal lords. So this is a magnific excuse to implement uh, robotics while introducing history. This year it's history, but perhaps next year is about another subject. So um, finally, I cannot end my intervention wi without uh, saying the, Im the paramount uh, importance of providing a really uh, cooperative, a really innovative environment where, where uh, students can test and develop their knowledge, their interest, even passion uh, for technology. Both girls and boys need uh, real encouragement to find a path towards a, a, an authentic, for saying in this way, technological career. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you, Guillem. Thank you, Guillem. And uh, yeah, congratulations also on your project. Um, Next, I would like to invite um, Elena Minuesa. She's from the um, City Council of San Cugat. She manages the cultural and heritage uh, seat, uh, of the, she's a cultural and heritage technician at the City of San Cugat. She's in charge of the pedagogical services of the museums of San Cugat and is leading projects in innovation in the fields and art, uh, of art and disability and special needs. And uh, she's focusing on accessibility and the real democratization of culture. She will talk about the project uh, Be My Guide, so it's all yours. Here you go, there's the mic. Thank you, Carlos. Please. Yes. Thank you. Please uh, give her a hand. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Elena Minuesa, and I represent the City Hall of Asan Cugat del Valles, that is a city next to Barcelona, 20 minutes from Barcelona. Um, I would like to briefly present my, my intervention, but with a practical case in which culture uh, has been a real mechanism for social inclusion. Um, first of all, however, I would like to raise a global reflection on uh, the benefits that the culture can bring uh, to our so societies, our so uh, complex societies, our complex cities. According to uh, Agenda 21 of culture, the culture strengthens, in fact, the uh, image of a territory, creates identification stories about what surrounds us, provides self-esteem and health to those who uh, enjoy it, and it's a guarantee, in fact, of equity and inclusion and generates social peace. Okay, but uh, I would like to ask, but what inclusion and culture do we talk about? Because uh, in my opinion, there is um, uh, a still a long way to go. Uh, in many of our institutions, in our cultural institutions or museums, that is the field uh, where I work, we keep going reproducing practices and models that I think uh, they are obsolete. Uh, for example, we do activities for deaf people, activities for blind people, activities for people with special cognitive needs. Um, is this real, the inclusion, the cultural inclusion we want? I think no. I think uh, projects that we actually develop end up discriminating by audiences, and this is not a real integration project. Um, we keep going doing obsolete models in heterodox cities. Uh, our societies, our cities are heter heterodox, diverse, and complex. So why our programs, our cultural programs, uh, don't, don't, don't can be like this? Um, I propose to break the classic ways of, cult uh, of culture as an elitist field and invest in new formulas, invest in uh, mix the audiences, um, switch them, let's think about it. And in fact, we have developed in San Cugat del Valles a project that I think it's an innovative project because uh, the person who maybe have the problem of communication apparently is in fact the person who transfers the knowledge. I mean, uh, People with uh, autism is uh, an Asperger's, the syndrome of Asperger. I don't know if you can um, know it, but is uh, an autistic spectrum disorder. So these people are the people who, in fact, are uh, the guided, the guided, to, the guide tours of the of our monastery, our monastery that is uh, for us the main important place in our city. So. Uh, for us, we are giving the message of, okay, let's do the things um, different in a new, in a new look uh, at culture. It's Saturday and Sunday, people from Friends Foundation, that is the Asperger's uh, Foundation, um, do these guided tours through the cloister of the mon Monastery of San Cugat. The main objectives we have um, are a new look through heritage, uh, break down stigmas and prejudices towards the people with autism. Uh, be, a re be a real uh, mechanism of integration and consider museums and cultural platforms like uh, our museum or our monastery as places to promote dialogue and as places to promote a social transformation. The person, I, I said before, but the person who has problems with communication is in fact the person who is transferring the knowledge and this is for us a real transformation a real uh, different uh, different way to to look at culture this is one of the project but we have more more project in 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 this in, in this area 
and since 2016 more than 1,700 people have participated in this initiative. So we are like very proud of it and yes, we, we, um, we are happy to share with, with all of you today. And now I would like to uh, end with, uh, if it's possible, a small video. I don't know if I can enter in the video and because it's just one minute, but I think it's very illustrative uh, way to approach the project, if it's possible. You can enter the image and you will have it. Yeah, thank you. És un projecte que neix de la voluntat de fer integració social doncs, de manera conjunta amb entitats com la Fundació Friends doncs, que vetlla per la socialització i la inserció de les persones amb síndrome de Asperger. La inserció social passa perquè les persones puguem treballar. Aquest és un programa d'oportunitats. I a més a més, doncs, no fer-ho a qualsevol lloc, sinó fer-ho en espais on els sancogatencs i les sancogatenques ens sentim molt orgullosos, com és el nostre patrimoni, en aquest cas, aquest monestir. A més a més, aquests educadors doncs, realment són un símbol a seguir per tots els ciutadans i ciutadanes i per altres educadors que també doncs, presten la seva feina aquí en el museu. El fet que es puguin integrar amb una feina els dona molta autonomia, autoestima, això fa que la seva vida es normalitzi i puguin socialitzar amb, amb companys i persones de la feina. En conclusió, tot això el que fa i el que els aporta aquesta feina és qualitat de vida. Les persones amb Asperger som capaços de com superar pors, de trencar els, aquests estereotips que la gent no es dona compte i no, i no veu. I jo crec que és molt important. Aquesta oportunitat ha sigut un canvi molt, molt gran per mi. M'agrada molt la meva feina perquè no és el mateix treballar doncs, amb gent que conegues, que portar un grup de gent desconeguda que mai has tractat amb ella i que no saps com si sortiran contents, si no... I també volem eh, donar-li a la cultura una nova mirada. No? Que creiem que és important també eh, veure el patrimoni des d'un altre punt de vista i ells realment poden fer aquesta tasca molt ben feta. Thank you for your attention. So, yeah, I think that we, we are seeing a, a, some sort of trend emerging here about really bringing the diversity of the, of the city into collision with one another. So, uh, next I would like to invite Miss um, uh, Susana Santos Nogueira. She's a councilwoman of the city of Amadora um, in Portugal. Susana has coordinated a national interinstitutional working groups related to childhood and social networks, and she's in the board of the Portuguese Instituto de Seguranza Social um, since 2002, and she's been her director, uh, the director since tw uh, 2012 to 2017. Um, she will be talking about the experience of participation into the policy making process, especially regarding the aging. Please, a hand for Susana. Okay, you can do that. Yes, that's next. Okay, good morning. Um, it's easier for me to speak from here because I'm not an English native, so I have to use my, my papers to guide me to all my presentation. Uh, first of all, um, my name is Susana. I, at the moment, I'm a councillor in Amadora City Council. Um, I'm going to present you my city. Uh, with uh, some numbers and uh, some characteristics of the city. Amadora uh, City Council is a large suburban and multicultural city in Lisbon Metropolitan. Uh, Lisbon is the capital of Portugal. In Amadora, when seniors reach 23% of the population, we realize we needed to rethink local policies regarding aging. 
the multiple needs of our citizens as they age had been taken into account and it became crucial to develop some preventive and some solutions oriented answers to make sure that longevity, longevity remained linked to quality of life. Such was done by evolving, sorry, by evolving the need, um, the multiple needs of our citizens um, as they want to identify some solutions and some, some needs they need. Um, we start by inviting all the citizens and not only the seniors persons um, to answer a very simple question. What has to change in Amadora uh, to improve the quality of life of those who live there? Um, the answer, as you can see, um, is in the slide addressing different issues from well-being to safety, from urban mobility to housing. So this is a different, um, a very complex matter about uh, what subject can we uh, can we get some intervention. We also involve private and public associations as well as a local university in our strategic approach. This was our drive to get everybody involved in a fresh and collective approach to the aging challenge. I would like to highlight some stages of our timeline. As you can see in the slide, um, first of all, the city council uh, joined efforts with a local university from Lisbon in order to mix the academic knowledge with local experience and information, that kind of uh, in, in, in relationship as already have been told here in the, in the second panel, I think. Um, this kind of knowledge with local experience and information as one provided by our cities in the question uh, has driven us to a draft of local strategic plan for aging. The draft of the plan was presented first advisory council on aging and we pay special attention to the inputs made by this aging council. Local associations and local business were also invited to make inputs and to sign the plan. In doing so, what we, we want to do is to commit themselves to the need to develop and to implement a local strategic plan for aging, when we, uh, in which one we are all actively participated. Well, this is not a, a very age-friendly slide with all these stairs, but as you can see, uh, there are uh, several steps that were climbed to make sure the plan was based in a methodology that involved always the participation. A shared plan governance structure was designed, strategic objectives and specific goals were set, and we also paid special attention to the monitoring and evaluation of the plan's targets. The plan was always intended to be like a live document. Uh, during its implementation, constant monitoring and evaluation were used and is, and is until used to redefine and adjust some targets. I will show you some of the four axes and the main, uh, and, and the main goals that we want to get uh, with, this, uh, with this pact. First of all, we want to focus in the basic care. Second, in inclusion. Third, in the participation uh, as in the perspective as a lifelong learning. And fourth, um, focus on the institutions, organization that works in our city in the, in the field that social responsibility and qualification of social associations can be delivered them and they can get back again to the old cities with all the part all, with all the associations and qualifications of them i will only highlight some of the uh, some of of what we all already achieved first i will tell you about municipal council of aging people we already has met three in three occasions the last meeting was in last October, and in and the, and the conclusions of the aging people uh, sent us a practical recommendation to the city council uh, to, so we, they can guide us uh, in our priorities for the next year. Um, the second highlight that I'll do is a special program for informal caregivers that it's, all always in, that it's in progress at this moment. 
And the third, um, a special partner uh, this year started a pilot project regarding uh, the dementia area with the creation of a neurostimulation facility that focus in the methodology to help families and people with dementia to get more, uh, more, uh, more active and to not to progress so much the, the illness. Where are we now? First, <laughs> first surprise it by the participation of local business. For us, this was a very, a, a very new event. Um, normally, we are used to work with public areas and non-profit institutions, but this kind of relationship with local business, uh, for us, it was really surprising. Um, I can tell you that even yesterday, a new group of uh, these local business joined us, the plan, uh, in the presence of the Social Security Minister of our country, who wanted to emphasize the importance of this plan and these local actions. Secondly, we are struggling with the need to maintain everybody's commitment, as well as with the need to keep every partner in the same track. To end, the future of aging is already here. It is up to us to define how the later years will be experienced and how, we will, um, how well we are preparing our cities for the demographic revolution we are already facing. Near two, two years has gone by since we started this process. Today, we can say that the participative approach allows us to take a qualitative leap in the way aging is being addressed in the city of Amadora. Thank you for, so much for your attention. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Um, well, I would like to call now um, Michael Castle Miller. Um, he is the executive director and the founder of Refugee Cities and Polydesk Consulting. Uh, Michael is a consultant who has developed laws, policies, and governance frameworks for special economic zones and special status cities in over 18 countries. He was previously the director of Locus Economica and a World Bank consultant. Um, I, I'm going to quote exactly like the introduction to his panel, but to his presentation, because I, I think it, it just it can only be quoted. So the question is, how can we overcome the political obstacles to, make, to migrant integration through sustainable development zones or refugee cities as spaces that benefit not only migrants, but also local communities, politicians, foreign investors, and the international community at once? So uh, a pending issue, a hot issue. I look forward to listening to you. Thank you, Michael. Thank Please you. give him a hand. Thank you. Is this on? Can you hear me? Good. Great. Thank you. Um, so I want you to imagine that you're the prime minister of a country. And in your country, you're dealing with a huge number of migrants, desperate migrants, people fleeing conflict from a neighboring country, uh, uh, climate-induced um, natural disasters, um, and poverty, people in seek of opportunities in your country migrating to the cities, and they're settling just outside of your major cities and in your cities, seeking opportunities. And the people in those cities are beginning to call out for you to do something about this problem. What exactly? It's not clear. So you consult with your top advisors and other members in your, in your governments, and you ask for solutions. And they come back with three different responses. One is, the hardline approach, which is we have to force them out. We have to keep them out. Security and detention centers along the border to keep them out of our country. The other response is we use camps, uh, displaced persons camps, refugee camps. And we work with the UN and, and other humanitarian organizations to provide food, medical care, and basic needs for people. Uh, but the problem with both with this solution is that this, these are temporary solutions and you know that, that this, so, so, this, uh, this problem isn't going to be temporary. Oftentimes uh, refugees spend 10 to 20 years of their life in a refugee camp, unable to work, unable to use their skills for that whole time, dependent on aid. And you also know that the policing option, trying to keep them out, isn't really going to work anyway, because they're going to find ways of, of, of making it into the city. 
and it only makes them more scared of your of your um, of your security forces of the police. Um, then the other option that people who are more humanitarian minded are proposing to you is to integrate them into your economy, to allow them to work, to allow them to start businesses, encourage them to do it. Uh, this is a solution that countries like Uganda have done and, and developing countries uh, that, that have uh, taken in refugees have done. It's supported under the 1951 Refugee Convention. It's an obligation in some cases. And your chief, your, your, uh, chief economic advisor also believes that this is the best solution because they know that you have crucial labor shortages that, that uh, need to be met, that refugees can fulfill. And the best solution to this is to help refugees and other desperate migrants become self-supporting. And they can actually benefit the country in the medium to long term. But you know that you're probably going to lose your job in the next election if you support full integration of refugees. And the person who replaces you will probably be an extremist, a hardliner. And that won't help things. So what do you do? Well, cities have always played, have traditionally played a role of integrating migrants, desperate migrants, historically, into economic opportunities, to providing them with better opportunities. And they've made cities richer, more diverse, uh, more prosperous places because of, because of migrants coming in. Think of places like New York City was built like this and many other cities have become places, have become magnets of, of, of people seeking opportunity and safety. Our cities are meant to play this role, but they're unable to have control over immigration. They can't, they can't, uh, they don't have authority over who the national government lets into the country or not. Well, the solution we developed is called a sustainable development zone or a refugee city. And the idea is to create a special economic zone, a special legal jurisdiction that has different policies from the rest of the country. And in this zone, migrants would be legally allowed to work, legally allowed to start their own businesses, and there'd be reforms to the business environment, to the laws affecting businesses there, to create uh, a legal environment and, a, and institutions that support economic growth, both for the migrants in the country and for the local community there, who's also seeking, that's also seeking jobs, also seeking opportunities be a place where, instead of sprawling slums, where migrants settling there can have legal rights to a plot of land can, and, and basic shelter and can incrementally build on that uh, to, to live in and, and to farm if that's the appropriate setting or in cities to start businesses and, and to, to work in businesses. There's tremendous unlocked potential in the world's migrants that we're not tapping into. Uh, refugees play, and, and other desperate migrants can play crucial, a crucial role in the economic transformation of countries. And all we need to do is overcome the political roadblocks to, to integrating them into the economy. A special zone solution like this helps us get around those political roadblocks by integrating them in one particular country where both migrants and the local community can work together without fighting the, the political battles at the national level so that we can eventually make progress. Uh, in, in that and create a better future for migrants. Uh, I'm, I started a nonprofit called Refugee Cities to advance this concept. I also am a consultant uh, through uh, Politas Consulting where I help countries uh, develop legal frameworks for special zones like this all the time. And also Refugee Cities is now a project of Politas Labs, which is a think tank coming up with creative solutions for overcoming political roadblocks to socioeconomic transformation for countries. That's my talk. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your concepts with us. Um, next, uh, I would like to invite um, Tomer Shelusha. Uh, I don't know if I said that right. Um, Shlush, all right. He's an urbanist based in Tel Aviv. Uh, Tomer, he's uh, heading a small entrepreneurship called um, Urbanizator, uh, Urbanizator, which uh, has the mission of integrating urban problems and provide specific urban solutions. He will be talking about the sometimes complicated relationships between urban renewal and growing tourism and how properly managed and communicated this can build value for everyone. So take thank it Thank you, thank you. A special thank you to friends and colleagues from Israel. Uh, this conference is all about fostering relationship and I know that I am standing here thanks to my friends in the Israeli ecosystem. So hello, my name is Tomer Shlush. I am a tour guide and an urbanist from Tel Aviv, passionate about cities. So I offer consultation, guidance, and uh, research 
on cities in my business called Urbanizador. Uh, I'll present one of my projects that is model you can take and implement in your cities even today. So this is a common scene in Tel Aviv, in a lot of cities actually. The core thing about Tel Aviv is that everybody is young in Tel Aviv, as you can see. I had a person asking me, a tourist asking me if we kill old people. This, of course, is not the case. The truth is that when you come to Tel Aviv, you immediately become young. So I suggest traveling to Tel Aviv. That's a good solution for Susanna. This is for your elderly population. So not just in Tel Aviv, you see a bunch of people sitting next to a construction site. See the tractor in the background. Because a lot of cities face urban renewal as well as growing tourism. So a question here, how can we reconcile between urban renewal and growing tourism? That's the question. I'm not sure I'm clicking it right. OK. So that's the question that we want to face. So um, clicking again. OK. So I'm going to talk about the project uh, that is a good, a good practice for you to take home. I call it the little hotel that could, engaging tourists about urban renewal. OK. So this hotel in Tel Aviv had a problem. How will guests react to the site of a construction site right in front of the hotel? So first thought was, maybe no one will notice. As we say in Israel, baktana. Nobody will notice. So they noticed. This is what they saw from the balconies of the rooms at the hotel next to Dizengoff Square, right in the center of Tel Aviv. Now, you remember this site because I want to show you how it looks now. Uh, amazingly, even though this was the site from the rooms of the hotel guests, the hotel ranking on TripAdvisor and major tra travel sites did not drop. It actually went up. How come? Short answer, thanks to me. Uh, long answer, thanks to something I call uh, tourist engagement services. Sorry for the right and left arrows are mixing because we read Hebrew from right to left and not from left to right. So tourist engagement services was the answer. Every night there was a happy hour on the rooftop of the hotel. And a local tour guide, sometimes me, sometimes another guy, uh, we were engaging tourists about the urban renewal right in front of their faces. We were telling them about its importance, how central it is to Tel Aviv. So instead of trying to hide the problem, we turned the bug into a feature. So what happened later is that we monitored reviews on TripAdvisor and Booking.com. On TripAdvisor, for four months that we administered tourist engagement services, we saw 50 TripAdvisor reviews, and 95% of them were good to excellent. That is 70% five-star reviews, 25% four-star reviews. The hotel ranking went up three places. Some reviews specifically mentioned the tour, guiding, the tour guide approaching the hotel guests as a good feature that they appreciated. So huge success. When tourist engagement services were discontinued, as constructions were still going on, hotel ranking dropped. 10 places. So it's not a nice to have solution, it's a must have solution. So just to formalize what we're talking about, this is the bug. The municipality advances urban renewal, then fearing construction mass businesses either ask for compensation or oppose renewal altogether. Um, the tourists feel left out and they won't recommend to others nor come again themselves. And eventually we get less tourism and loss of city revenue. Now let's turn it into a feature. The municipality can advance urban renewal and facilitate tourist engagement services such as we saw earlier. Our businesses now welcome the idea of urban renewal as they're getting some help to do it or to uh, administer it. And eventually we see tour guides or local experts telling people that this is important for the city, they engage them, and tourist uh, uh, experience is much better, more tourism, more tourism and increased revenue. So you might be saying, OK, how does it look now? This is how it looks now. This is what people are seeing. 
right in front of the hotel that earlier was a construction site. So this is how Dizengoff Square looks now today in Tel Aviv. So I suggest we all take a plan now to go to Tel Aviv and get young again. OK, so now you're probably asking, OK, I'm not a hotel. I'm not in the tourism industry. So how does it relate to me? Exchange the word tourist for resident. That's what I did. So after tourist engagement services, I developed guided tours as urban solution. I took groups of people to see important projects in the center of Tel Aviv, such as the new metro that we are now building in Tel Aviv. We had five tours, 500 people came to see how that project is going on, and it was a huge success. Also, with municipalities in Israel, we did guided tours as urban, as urban solution to help residents understand what they're seeing, what their urban renewal projects is all about. So you can read more success stories on my website, urbanizator.com. And my message to you is that when working on your urban project, don't try and hide it. Expose it, preferably with a tour guide. My name is Tom Schluss. Check out urbanizator.com. And thank you very much for your attention. Oh, oh, that's okay. That's okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tomer. That was very enlightening. Um, our last presentation, finally, I would like to um, welcome Miriam Rora Pareda. She's the program director at Urban X, an accelerator built by Mini and Urban Us. She's passionate about improving cities through technology and design, worked previously at MIT's Sensible City Lab at OMA and Mateo Arquitectura. And uh, she will be talking about New York's Urban X Startup Accelerator. So Miriam, please give her a hand. Hello, my name is Miriam, and I'm Program Director for Urban X. And Urban X is a venture accelerator for startups reimagining city life. It was built by Mini from the BMW Group in partnership with the venture fund Urban Us. And today I'm going to talk about why I think Urban X is not only relevant today, but also critical and urgent. And I'm going to do that from the perspective of three main pillars at the core of why Urban X exists. Number one is responding to the responsibility for the urban future, something that probably a lot of you relate to since we're in this conference. Um, and that has to do with the fact that how are we going to build the next um, uh, the, the, uh, the, what we build in the next 30 years is actually the same amount of what we have currently built. And how we do that is really going to shape how many people live in cities for the years to come. So how do we want to do that? I'm not going to go into it too quick, too very much. But is it a market-driven approach? Is it how we've been building in the last 150 years? Or are we, gonna, are we going to rethink towards a more human-centric um, approach, putting people really at the center of the equation? Number two is supporting slightly crazy, over-optimistic, forward-thinking people. And this has to do with the fact that when we look at who are the people who really were at the core of, of the invention of some of the technologies that are really behind the cities today, they're not corporations, they're not government, but they're actually people who had a vision, people who um, had a new technology that they wanted to bring to market. So um, these inventors from electricity, the elevator, the bicycle or the traffic light are very much like the founders of startups today. And they have the same challenges in some ways. Lack of funding, lack of basic resources, sometimes lack of exposure, and a lack of community around it. And the third pillar would be harnessing the power of people coming together. There's something truly magical when people come together. As population um, density aggregates, the productivity also rises. And it's this notion of synergy when people come together. And that manifests in many other ways. And also at the scale of a city, but at the scale of people interactions. So it kind of, it, it's when we, there are also studies that have to do with this idea of the productivity of an in-person meeting versus the productivity of just an email conversation and how that in-person really makes a difference. So Urban X, um, related to the pillar number one, we create a platform that invests across urban tech solutions. So from mobility to real estate to construction to energy, water, waste, civic and government technologies, the first question is always, 
what is the problem that you're solving for? And the second question is, can you bring your, your solution to 100 cities in five years? And if so, what would be the impact that you might be able to have? Number two is an investment platform with high value resources. So we invest in 100,000 in every startup that we support um, for a var variable amount of equity. And we have a series of resources around them. So we have a space in New York when people can come and work from a, an, a series of in-house experts, mainly for product design and engineering, and a network um, that mainly helps startups develop their customer development, but also get to the next round of fundraising. And number three, um, we're building this community of founders, thinkers, and innovators, especially with value. So we're open about the challenges that we're facing and believe that technology is agnostic, but we, they can really have an impact that can be both positive and negative. So open about these com conversations around the impact that these technologies can have. So in the last three years, we've, we've invested in 37 startups over the course of five cohorts. 42% of our teams are international. 37% have women founders. We have 2% emissions rate as of the last cohort. And also as of the last cohort, 100% follow on funding for all of our startups. So I'm just going to present very quickly five, um, five startups that uh, we've helped build in the last um, three years. One is LunaWave. It's a high-performance radar sensor for autonomous vehicles that, can, that is able to kind of read across different weather conditions. And there's that, is that it's significantly cheaper than LiDAR um, radars. Two would be Farm Shelf. is an indoor farming unit to bring farming as close as possible to a kitchen that is mainly deployed in restaurants and other um, communities. Parkin Diamond is a foldable helmet that looks like a hat. Um, very relevant for the increase in microtransit that we are seeing. Swiftera is a satellite that provides real-time ultra-high resolution urban imagery for mobility, planning, and leisure. They literally fly these satellites with balloons up to the stratosphere. And Industrial Organic, turnkey facilities for recycling organic waste into new products. Um, so to conclude, this is beyond UrbanX. It's about being able to provide a platform that um, can design for scale. And if it can design for scale, it can scale for impact. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you. Fantastic. So, um, so that, was, that was our speakers for today. Um, and uh, now it's your opportunity as the audience to ask them some questions. Um, just uh, going over um, a little bit what we saw. Um, remember that we talked about the city as a classroom. Um, we talked about the role of universities, robotics, inclusion in the city, the role of the elderly and how to design policies to include um, the needs of the elderly, refugees, and how to integrate them and overcome the political difficulties that we have, um, how to combine and actually um, make a city change and urban renewal um, make a, be a positive for satisfaction of life and visiting the city, and, and, and also how um, entrepreneurship can lead to transformation in, um, in urban uh, environments as well. So, I think we have seen um, we have seen several um, several issues that I think are, are of particular interest. I was particularly shocked. I don't know if we have any questions. If you have some questions, please raise your hand because okay, here we go. Please, let's start with you. Yeah, it's just a question to uh, hi, this is Frederick Tour from the International Clean Tech Network. Just a question to uh, to Edna Pasha actually. <clears throat> I thought it was very interesting to hear all the. Uh, the Israeli interventions and uh, we know that there's a huge focus on innovation in Israel and, and I think it's actually due to a lot of factors that you maybe didn't mention a lot of uh, cultural historical and maybe also relig religious factors and maybe even geopolitical factors because you, ha you do have a military as well where you have uh, you have to be in the military for two years 
women have to have as well, and there's a lot of focus on innovation in there. So my question is, um, how do you structure this innovation in terms of the internal Israeli um, way of, of organizing all of this? The reason why I'm asking is because we went to the United States a month ago. Uh, some of us from ICN, we saw there's a lot of focus on incubators and accelerators in the United States. That's, that's what they focus on. In Europe, there's a huge focus on clusters, which means this triple helix focus where you have the public authorities coming into the, the triangle as well. From an Israeli perspective, how do you do this, uh, especially with the focus on, on smart cities? Uh, thank you very much. Maybe I can have eye contact with you, if it's OK. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, of course, all the uh, things that you mentioned are very important, and they all contribute to the fact that we are the startup nation, and Tel Aviv is the startup city, and um, uh, we are the uh, second Silicon Valley, okay? Uh, with numbers, I'm not just uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, the image. Uh, it has to do with education. Um, uh, historically, uh, the Jewish people, wherever they were, they always had to run away because somebody was <laughs> having a pogrom over them. Somebody kicked them out of the country, as it was in Spain. Uh, you probably well know, in, in 1492, the queen and the uh, the people of uh, the country of Spain kicked their Jews out. So um, what can you take with you when you are kicked out all the time? Your brain. So education was number one always with the Jewish people. Military, yes, if you have to defend yourself against so many enemies around you, you have to be smart to outsmart them. Yes, but incubators run by the government for civilians were an Israeli innovation. The first venture capital fund in Israel was government owned. So it didn't just happen, it's a policy. Israel invests 4.6% of the GDP in R&D, in civilian R&D, in addition to the military R&D. Just for example, in Spain, the number is 0 0.8. So if you take 0 0.8 compared to 4.6 from the percentage from the GDP, of course you are going to, so, to, uh, to have innovation. But what I wanted to emphasize today is that the only way to create happy children in the future is if, if you prepare them today for the future. And the number one thing is that there will not be enough jobs. There will not be so many robotics will take care of everything almost that we do. So we have to invent our jobs in the future. How do you do that? You start with little kids. Actually, I think that I'm going to uh, next, this year, by the way, the same school, Hamanchil School in Ramat Gan, will go down to age six. And we want to prototype with kindergartens because the little kids are so smart and so creative, only the adults stifle them all over. So that's the idea behind the city as classroom, which I presented today. Now, I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried. Did I answer your question? So what did I miss? It's more about the structure itself in The structure is that we love experimentation. Whenever there is a problem, we experiment. We are very fast movers. I'm an old lady. They spoke about old ladies. I'm 76 years old, and I'm here standing innovative. If I don't I innovate every day something new, I get very sad. That's the only thing that keeps me. 
I have problems of accessibility, so the nice Fira has these, these little buggies that I use because you have to go kilometers in this <laughs> Fira to visit all of the, uh, um, everything that there is to, to see. So the answer is really that you have to experiment. All the stories about planning and strategy, this is too slow. You have to experiment. You want an innovative city? Just encourage experimentation and failures, by the way. People don't love risk. If you don't love risk, how can you innovate? You have to love risk, you have to love failure, you have to teach it to your children when they are very young. Did that help a little more? Yes, it did. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Edna. It certainly helped me, so thank you. One more question, yes. Uh, hi, uh, my question is for Michael. Uh, I'm very interested in like, uh, this, uh, like going through this barrier of migration, because I come from Colombia, and we have actually right now a really big issue with migration from Venezuela uh, crisis. And I would like to know like, if you can give me an example of this uh, like, uh, village or city that you build up uh, in order to have uh, this uh, certain new economy for, for migrants. So the question is, give an example of the refugee cities. Yeah, I actually forgot that part, forgot to give that part of my talk because the time ran out. Um, but we're working on, a, uh, on, on projects, sort of early stage projects in Libya. Could it closer, closer. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Uh, in Libya, of all places. Libya is a place where, you know, the, the national government isn't able to do anything now. There's about three, two or three different national governments. And so city mayors and local councils are the only ones like providing any governance uh, of the area. So we're helping develop a strategy for where uh, cities, municipalities, and um, special development zones, this new creation, can uh, absorb uh, both migrants entering Libya, trying to reach Europe, and, as well as the Libyan people to create opportunities for them. So there, I'm just about to start a project in Ethiopia with UN Habitat uh, to uh, incorporate their IDP camps, internally displaced person camps, with their industrial parks program, which is sort of a special economic zone type thing. Um, still Jordan, closer, still closer. Uh, oh, uh, can't hear sorry you. about that. Uh, Jordan, uh, the country of Jordan has also made steps in this direction by uh, incorporating refugees into its special economic zones there. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, there, there's developments happening that are sort of, um, th that the refugee city's idea is sort of, a, is sort of a, um, a goal that can take many different forms. And so that's what we're, we help, we help uh, countries sort of adapt the, the idea to their, their particular context, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Michael. Do we have one more question? Yep. Hello, this is for Dr. Yaniv. Um, so my name is Courtney Filato. I'm from Ohio State University in the United States. So excited to hear about other universities doing smart things on their campus. Um, can you share a little bit about um, maybe some of your lessons learned in transforming your campus and region into a living lab? We're on that same journey right now. Um, lots of barriers and constraints. Um, so we'd just love to hear if you could do it over again, um, some things you'd recommend. OK, here we go. Well, thank you yeah, for the question. Right. Uh, as, as I mentioned, we have a few projects. I mentioned only one of them. Um, they are really very, uh, um, I mentioned the urban uh, heat island as a project that is a collaboration of, of cities, scientists, and uh, technology providers. Uh, we have many, many more. Uh, for example, one, one of the project is uh, uh, investigation of uh, air pollution in uh, um, education institutions. It's, uh, it's uh, surprising, maybe not, that every morning the uh, level of uh, air pollution near schools is very high because of, of car coming. Uh, so here we collaborated with the city that uh, decided to solve the problem for, for their military school, for their uh, uh, schools. Um, and uh, um, 
here again it's a collaboration of, of uh, uh, technology providers. We put sensors all over the, the environment of, of the schools. Um, it's a participation of parents who wanted to solve the problems with scientists. Uh, in our side, uh, it was uh, uh, an environmental scientist, environmental uh, uh, law people who could, uh, it's, a, it's a class of students that took the project for one year and uh, after measuring and, and presenting that there is a real problem, uh, the class um, uh, suggested all kinds of, of solutions like uh, carpool and walkpool and uh, other solu solutions and with the, the participation of the parents that could solve the problem and, and provide a solution. So there are a few, few other projects like, like this one. And I hope we gave you just a taste of, of what we are doing. Thank you, Jan. Excellent. So do we have perhaps one more question? OK, so. You have a question? Yeah, sure. I don't have a question. I would just like to um, uh, strengthen what Eyal just said, that in another city where we uh, did a, pro a project, we turned the little children into researchers in the area of environmental uh, protection, quality of air in the city of Haifa. That, by the way, was the nominee last night for a smart city, but Singapore uh, took the, the prize. But Haifa was one of the nominees. And the idea was that the children were going to collect data for the Technion, which is another university in Israel, about the quality of the air on the roofs of their buildings. When the citizens were asked to do that, they did not collaborate. But when the children were asked to collaborate and become little data collectors, elementary schools again, they became all of a sudden partners in this project. And uh, the project was used in, in a PhD dissertation of one of the doctoral students of the Technion who could use this data, big data collection that the kids collected for him. So it's again about starting when they are very young. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. Well, I think that this, this wraps up this, um, this panel, this wraps up the panel uh, that, that we had today. Um, just uh, the final words of what, what I think bonds together, a summary of maybe what bonds together all of these presentations. The cities are increasingly diverse in their nature of the nature of the inhabitants, their needs, their perspectives. They have perhaps always been like this, but with increasing mobility and increasing changes in, our, in, in the way that we move about the world, our cities are becoming an opportunity or a challenge. And what we have seen here today is how this diversity put together, bringing down the barriers, mixing people with special needs, the aging, migrants, tourists, road workers, students, professors, kids, build, making people come together and think about the city, the needs and the opportunities that the city has is really a way forward and with actual practical uh, examples of a way forward to really build better life in our cities. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers for your participation today. Thank you for the audience and see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>